I could just say thank you and sit down. But there were one or two other little things I wanted to say. Uh, I do want to thank all of you for being here tonight for uh, Samaritan Counseling Center's New Mexico Ethics and Business Awards. Um, I'm not an out-of-state expert, but I am CEO of a growing social profit business, and I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> but wisdom can come from some of the most unlikely sources, as my daughter, a school teacher in St. Louis, keeps reminding me when she sends me little email morsels. If you don't have a daughter who's a teacher, you have not yet discovered how much wisdom there really is out there. But here are some small pieces she shared with me called Great Truths About Life that Little Children Have Learned. First, puppies still have bad breath even after eating a Tic Tac. When your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. <laughs> Coming into the spring season, don't wear polka dot underwear under white shorts. Here's one for my son and his Rhodesian Ridgeback. You can't trust dogs to watch your food. And you can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. Well, maybe I can add a little bit more wisdom to our lives this evening. You know, most of Samaritan's work is, is uh, carried on behind closed doors of 21 therapists who bring healing and hope to the troubled lives of several hundred children, adults, and families each week. It's satisfying work. But confidentiality is essential, so we don't get to talk about it very much. This awards program, then, is our way of trying to bring greater health to the larger community in which our patients live. Samaritan believes, quite simply, that if society upholds high ethical standards, people's lives will be better. And certainly, the money raised in tonight's event will help us provide care for several hundred poor and uninsured people who otherwise would not be able to receive needed help. So thanks for joining us at the dinner table this evening. Good stuff often happens around the meal table. Seder meals and Holy Communion, Thanksgiving feasts and rowdy family suppers. In the best of these, like our table on the patio last night with our good friends Neil and Sandy, Stories are told, manners are taught, laughter lifts our spirits, and high ideals are offered for the days ahead. If I had magic powers to change one thing about the way families live these days, I would insist that families sit down together at least four nights a week, turn off the TV, and enjoy a meal together. There's actually some solid research showing that when families do this, children do better in school and get in trouble less often, and everyone's health is improved. So besides those little bits of wisdom I offered earlier, there's your counseling tip for the evening. <clears throat> a couple of mornings each week, I sit around a different table drinking coffee with Dennis and Sam and Sharon at the gym after our workout. Friends like to tease us about exercising our elbows as we lift our coffee cups to our mouths, but we actually do work out beforehand. We also do something else very important. We share ideas. Oh, we gossip a little bit and rate the rotary programs from the day before and pretend to solve the world's problems. But we talk seriously about big ideas, too. Let me tell you why this is so important. The four of us do not see eye to eye on politics and religion. Sure, sometimes we just exercise the ancient family Thanksgiving rules of declaring certain subjects off limits. But I think all four of us believe that if friends who hold conflicting views can't figure out how to still be friends and even exchange different opinions 
with each other sometimes, our nation is in bigger trouble than we may think. One idea we've toyed with for several years now grows out of our concern about the awful meanness of today's political landscape. <clears throat> so last week we talked again about launching an organization to foster more respectful and truthful conversation about issues. Since I'm retiring as CEO of the Samaritan Counseling Center, maybe that's my next project, to create the Association for Civil Society. Alexis de Tocqueville, <laughs> Alexis de Tocqueville would not be surprised by this idea. When he visited the U.S. in the 19th century, he was impressed with the way Americans were always forming associations, joining together to solve problems. It's how we Americans made this country great. We talk amongst ourselves and we help each other out. So why am I telling you this on this night when we celebrate ethical business leaders? Here's why. Just as Samaritan believes that an ethical business is, nurture, is, is uh, an ethical society is more likely to foster good mental health, I would suggest that ethical business is nurtured in a moral society. And the first step toward a moral society begins, I believe, with civility. Yale Law professor Stephen Carter wrote an important book a few years ago titled simply Civility, in which he argues that our great freedom has been terribly abused by those who've used that freedom for selfish behavior that undermines society. Professor Carter's antidote for this tragic situation is a simple ethical goal. We must use our gift of freedom for the common good. And then he goes on to argue that this common good is best achieved by reclaiming civility in our political and business and community dealings with one another. Civility means more than being polite. At a more basic level, civility is a fundamental attitude of appreciation for others, which affirms that my well-being is tied to your well-being. Creating a civil society is often as simple as loving your neighbor as yourself and doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. So this moral society sustained by, by moral capitalism that values the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit begins, I think, with civility. Sadly, we continue to witness troubling examples of incivility. A city councilor sends racist jokes through his municipal email account. A local Ponzi scheme bilks hundreds of people out of millions of dollars. Misleading and patently false reports about health care reform are, are spread by political and civic leaders. Talk radio pollutes the airwaves with hateful, uninformed, and inflammatory rhetoric aimed at demonizing our neighbors to build ratings. Such incidents cause us all to wonder whether our great country that was founded to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity is in fact coming apart at the seams. But there's good news to counter this gloomy picture. Whenever our nation encounters a problem, American entrepreneurial spirit looks for a solution. Lately, for example, I've been interested to see several versions of a civility covenant going around. The first one, I believe, was put out by an interfaith group of New Orleans religious leaders, and it called upon people to engage in civil discourse. Here's their six-point pledge. One, we will disagree without being disagreeable. Two, we will affirm the right of the other to differ as we affirm ours. Three, we will debate the issues, not debase the individual who differs from us. Four, we will avoid listening to, encouraging, or endorsing those in public and in private life who demean the dignity of others by name-calling and labeling. Five, we will not acknowledge or forward electronic messages or videos designed to demonize or humiliate persons or groups. And sixth, we will be examples of civility to 